answers, let's get booge. Listen to Abe Thompson for an hour. I'd rather fuck a blood relative. It's Abe Thompson. Ladies and gents, welcome to episode 156, 156, wow, of A. Thompson and Other Disappointments. What's up to the Patreons? What's up to the cult members, the people of the Booge? Uh, If it's your first time listening, when I say that, people of the Booge, I mean bourgeoisie. This is a premium podcast. This is the first tier, elite level podcast. I've got to be careful saying the word elite, haven't I? Anyway, look, people of the booge, what's up? Uh, special doff of the cap to our newest inductee to my Binfluencer cult, a chap called Kai, who joined the Patreon the other day. I hope you're all grand. Uh, I'm going to jump into this today. No podcast admin, no sales pitch for the Patreon. If you haven't joined yet, you're missing out, just like you miss out on everything. So you know what? Fine. You do you. All right, you sit there with your fucking dressing gown on, drinking gin alone, listening to me. But just just know this. All right. There is a modest sized cult for this show and you could be a part of that. But instead, you have opted to spend that three pounds a month on fucking what? Another flat white. Well, fucking big. Wow. (laughs) I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it hope it suitably woke you up. So you had the energy and attention to detail to, you know, I don't know, whatever the fuck it is that you do all day. Sit there staring at your computer screen, trying to think of reasons not to kill yourself. You know, try, trying to think of reasons to bother answering the phone in your shitty customer service job or reception, you know, when you know it's just going to be another pissed off customer. Or it could be your mum, you know, who weirdly you know, always sounds like a pissed off customer for some reason. I don't know. Maybe that's just mine. Um, But yeah, it's good that you had the caffeine, the caffeine synthetic energy from your three pound flat white instead of dumping it into my Patreon. You know, it's good that you had that to be able to handle that job, that call from your mum. Rather than my Patreon and having a nice group of frankly lovely and like-minded individuals to talk shit and share memes with all day. Good for you. I'm sure you've made the right decision. Anyway, look, loads going on. So let's jump into it. Matt Hancock is the big story today, isn't he? Matt Hancock. I gave him my tap dancing tosser award on TikTok this morning. Cheers, by the way. He's just a proper weapon isn't he? Like, when you say that phrase, like, oh, oh, that guy, oh, he's a fucking weapon. He's a proper weapon, that guy. Like, I don't know if I've got listeners in, like, you know, America. Sometimes I see people from Hong Kong have tuned in or, like, Australia. If you don't, if you're not familiar with the slang, when you call someone a weapon, it doesn't mean that they're dangerous or, you know, you steer clear of them or illegal, you know. It's like bellend. It's like twat. It's like that guy, oh, it's a... Proper fucking weapon. You know, it's not good. And when you think of Matt Hancock, that's what I get in my head. And I think he kind of, you know, he skated by through the pandemic relatively unscathed. And I think it was out of... I think it was out of everyone having this sort of blitz spirit about COVID, you know? I think people adopted this, this like, look, it's all shit and it's all scary right now. It is. But this Tory guy, Matthew, this guy, he can at least feign empathy and appear to be vaguely in touch with how serious this all is. But no, it turned out, (laughs) or it felt at least, as though in retrospect, he wasn't in possession of empathy or he didn't have a grasp of how serious things were. Because it appears... (laughs) choosing my words very carefully here because it appears that he ignored advice from Chris Chris Whitty about the importance of testing and effectively every couriered a load of COVID riddled grannies back into their nursing homes, right? 
And this has been the allegation uh, tabled at him for a while, and he's always rejected it and denied it. But now today, Isabel Oakeshott has revealed a bunch of texts and they appear to sort of back it. It doesn't put him in a great light, right? He's had a bad day, guys. But if we cast our minds back to the pandemic, like he could, here's the thing, he could do a good impersonation of an empathetic person, couldn't he? Like he was stood there with the podium, arms out like a vicar. Like he had the right pauses in the right places. Like I'm not going to say he had puppy dog eyes or anything, but he he had a way about him where I think, and look, you may disagree, but I thought he seemed like he genuinely cared about shit, you know? And then it came out that he appeared to, <laughs> again, choosing my words very carefully here, <laughs> I'm, I'm having enough trouble hanging on to my house as it is. I don't need somebody fucking suing me and like having to remortgage and sell it to pay for my legal bills because of some clumsily worded nonsense on a shit podcast. It appeared to. <laughs> In fact, you know what? I actually like that way of wording things. You know, because when you say he appeared to beat the shit out of his girlfriend for finishing the last of the beaver town four pack like i'm I, i'm not talking matt hancock now obviously but i'm saying like when you phrase things like aid appeared to take a shit in the princess diana memorial fountain like it makes it sound like you're scared of being sued right oh it appeared to have like you can't say he beat the shit out of his wife because you don't know that that happened right the person hasn't admitted it yet and you don't have the smoking gun proof. So instead, what you do is you lean on the reasonable interpretation of some words or actions, and you say, this person appeared to have done X. But here's what I love about it, right? Like, you could willfully misinterpret that, still. Like, he appeared... <laughs> like, he walked through the door, you know? He appeared specifically to like he came down here specifically to take a shit in the princess diana memorial fountain do you know what i mean like it's he appeared to do this do you know what so anyway so when i say matt hancock appeared to dispatch some pensioners back to their care homes riddled with covid to breathe death onto their bingo buddies ignoring all the advice i'm not saying he definitely did that Obviously, I'm just saying he may have decided to appear there specifically to do that. <laughs> like, maybe, allegedly, reportedly, etc., etc. And the reason, anyway, that this is in the news now is Isabel Oakeshott, who wrote his book for him because he's dyslexic. I don't know if you knew that. Um, if you've heard him like campaign about it, uh, how it's like it's one of his causes, one of his charity, raising awareness things that he, you know, he helps and supports. Which, look, you know, I, I don't know if help and support from Matt Hancock is necessarily something that you want. Like, it's like, like Matt Hancock. Matt Hancock famously said he was going to throw a protective ring around these care homes, right? And then he oversaw this chaotic and witless approach, just firing up Uber Eats and ordering a SARS sandwich for every nursing home in the country. Pretty much. I mean, that is the opposite of a protective ring for something, you fucking idiot. The total opposite. <laughs> like, he's such a sociopath, he doesn't understand what help and hurt are. It's like he's... Someone's unplugged the cables to his empathy synapses, you know, but slammed them back in the wrong way around. <laughs> Plus and minus polarity reversed. <laughs> so now, like with dyslexia, it'd be like, yeah, hi, I'm um, I'm Matt Hancock. I, I want to raise uh, awareness of dyslexia. I want to help dyslexics read better. Oh, OK. Um, how? Well, I'm going to shit in your eyeballs. No, you're not, Matt. You're not. How many times? <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Matt Hancock, and I, I'm going to be a good husband. Uh, how? I'm going to fuck one of your friends and blow up two families. Jesus Christ, Matt, for fuck's sake. Can you have a day off helping people? 
but, but, but I got into politics to help people. Well, maybe have a break. Maybe do some TV work or something. <laughs> then he's like, that, that's not a bad idea, actually. You know, actually, these, these lads from ITV say they want to help me get my media career going. I, I'm sorry, they, 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 they want to help you? Yes, yes, this is, this is what they said. You know, his assistant at this point has cottoned on to the help and the hurt. The, you know, they're like, um, OK, look, I, this, this help and hurting back to front thing. It, it's like, forgive me for being a bit nervous here, Matt, but how exactly do they want to help you? Well, they... um. They want me to swallow dog testicles on live TV. Oh, for God's sake. So anyway, look. He did his book. He did his I'm a Celeb thing. Uh, and then his book flopped. Like, it barely troubled the top 200. I read it hit, like, number 198 out of 200 in the first week. It sold 3,000 copies in the first week. And then it vanished from the book charts. And bear in mind, like, a hefty chunk of those 3,000 were probably journalists, right? Or his, you know, his kids, maybe. Or cousins. Do, do, do your Uncle Matt a favour. Could you pick up a copy? Like, help me out here a bit. It's a massive flop, inarguably. But there are, there are door-to-door salesmen selling encyclopedias that are completely redundant since Google. Those guys sell more books than, man, than Matt Hancock. <laughs> Yellow Pages distributed more books that year than Matt Hancock. So anyway, look, he's having a shit time. And then, you know, he, he had to resign, right? And he lost I'm a Celeb. And they made him do the terrible jungle trial things. And then his book comes out and it's just immediate pulp fodder. And then just as he's forming his own TV production company, right? I read that this week, right? He's literally like, think, I think things are going really well. <laughs> you know, I've done uh, I'm a Celeb. I've done the SES one. I, 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 think I, should, um, I think I should start my own production company, clearly. Like two days after he announced that shit, the actual fucking writer of his book, because he didn't write it, he's dyslexic. We've covered this, people. The ghost writer of his book, who had access to all his press releases and emails and texts, Isabel Oakshot, leaks the text and it's fucking hilarious because Hancock was obviously trying to rehabilitate his public image right <laughs> trying to get back to the top I think is what he was trying which even that is ridiculous that is delusional of Matthew Hancock is it not rehabilitate his public I just have to get back to where I was Back when people loved me. Like, no, Matt, nobody loved you. People always thought you were a clattering fanny. Standing weirdly close to female journalists. No understanding of personal space. Or perhaps, you know, an over-ramped understanding of where you sit on the sexual attractiveness ladder. I don't know. And you're fucking fake crying on morning television. Like, rehabilitating Matt Hancock is like watching fucking Location Location. And hearing some daft cunt talking about, like, renovating a derelict sewage works. <laughs> like, you know? Like, we're going to get this place back to its former glory. Like, you can't polish a turd, Magnus. I mean that almost literally. Anyway, he was trying to rehabilitate his public image. With this book. You know, with I'm a Celebrity. But the book is the sad part. The book is the thing that's come back to bite him. Working with this conservative journalist, Isabel Oakshot. And lo and behold, she's fucked him over. And what's so funny about it is like, I said this on TikTok this morning. But it bears repeating, right? Like, how fucking funny is it that you've got this party of sociopath, right? And it's all fun and games for them. They love patting each other on the back. You're Reese Moggs, you're Marc Francoise, you're... You know, Dominic Rupp. They, they all love to backpack, you know, hanging out at the Carlton Club 
laughing. They all went to the same private school or whatever, laughing about how poor people just need to work harder. Oh, Barnaby, you rotter. Oh, you're such a monster. Quaff, quaff. Laughing about how hard other people have it and how they're manipulating the media. You're like, that is a good time. Good for you. Sociopaths together in the Carlton Club. Have some fun. But eventually, it always comes around. In the end, they're going to have to remember that they are still all individually sociopaths. And, it, you know, that's all fun. I'm glad that you had a good time and whatever. But this guy here that you've been partying with, he will fuck you over as soon as your career is in the way of his own self-interest. Right? Like, there's something sort of, I don't know, a light bit of dark comedy, a little bit of comic relief in a, in a dark time, right? Like, I imagine a couple of them talking to each other in the Carlton Club. One of them saying, oh, God, did you did you see those bloody benefits claimants crying outside the food bank? Yeah, yeah, I did. Stupid poor people. Like, why don't, why don't they try investing their money? God, they're so stupid. Oh, I know. Oh, oh, my gosh. It's their own fault. And I tell you what, their hardship is making... I am, I am projecting my tadpoles into the threads of my boxes right now at the thought of how much they struggle. Oh, yeah, yeah me, me too. Yeah, me too. And, and I'll tell you what, Barrington. Tell you what, when I buy out that block of flats down there that they all live in and hike their rents, oh, God, it's going to make them so angry and desperate. That, um, that block of flats down there, that's up for sale, is it? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. And you, you haven't closed the deal yet? Well, no, no, um, not yet. But don't get any ideas, uh, Barrington. You know, I've, I've met the agent four times. It's, it's as good as done. Right, but it's not, um, it's not 100%. Finalized. Well, no, but you know, don't look. Don't be a tosser. I only mention it because we're all sociopaths together, having a good time, laughing at poor people, right? But it, it, I mean, it's just that you know, I I am looking to invest in more property, right? But this is this is my investment. Well, not not yet. It's not right. But you wouldn't just you wouldn't just slide in there and take this from me. We well, yeah, th th that's not on. Well, I don't think I'll have to because I still have these pictures of your brother in the back room of the Go Go Club in Copenhagen last year. You, you bastard. You, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't leak those pictures. Withdraw from the deal and hand it over to me. No, 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 this, this isn't fair. I'll tell you what, any more of this back chat and I'll throw in the audio of you asking to drink the barmaid's bath water. Like, that is, that is the sort of thing I'm talking about. It's like they're all sociopaths having a good time until one of them gets in the way of the other one. They're still sociopaths, right? <laughs> and you get this sense that with Hancock... I don't know, like, I mentioned he had a way about him, about sort of, you know, feigning empathy or seeming like he understood the gravity of the situation. But he was very much an outlier. Like, none of the rest of them were like that, even bother pretending to empathise, I don't think. And in that sense, I always got this sense that, you know, Hancock was like a sort of, um, I don't know, like a you know, a lost puppy, a sort of, you know, a baby Labrador, but one that's like cavorting with drunk grizzly bears that are going to devour him, you know, like just, he's just cluelessly, witlessly, naively going about his business. You know, he's like, oh, I think I'll, um, I think I'll go on I'm a Celeb. Oh, I think I'll, I think I'll do this thing and then maybe a book and I could, maybe I could get a fellow Tory, maybe Isabel could help <laughs> help me i'm sure she won't fuck me over i'm sure she could be trusted with my personal private personal text messages you know three months later she royally fucks him over fucking curb your enthusiasm music starts playing like just witlessly naively wandering in it's like like i swear to god somewhere in suffolk right now matt hancock is sat with a glass of whiskey a fucking triple shot crying into it like you're so you're so stupid matt like why why did why did you trust her why why are you so trusting matt that's your problem you never cut out for the politics game you're too good you're too sweet you feel too you've got too big a heart matt you know maybe i uh, fuck it like maybe he did get confused when she said she was going to help him. Like the old reverse polarity kicked in. <laughs> I 
There you go. Comedy callback for you. You don't get that shit on rest is politics, do you? So Isabel Oakshot fucks him over. Brexit Barbie does the 180 on him. Cheers, by the way. And it's funny, man, like the way the way this is reported in The Guardian is just chef's kiss. It's, you know, it says I'm going to read it out to you now. Here we go. Conservative MPs and political journalists have expressed some astonishment that Hancock entrusted millions of words of his private correspondence to Oakshot of all people a journalist who has long made clear her disdain for his lockdown policies. She has been accused of having a poor track record when it comes to source protection and is in a relationship with the leader of the anti-lockdown reform party. (laughs) And they quote this guy, Robert Colville, of some fucking right-wing think tank. I don't know who he is, but he says, he says, the main lesson I've learned from this is not to hire someone who absolutely hates your signature policy as your ghostwriter. Like, oh, burn. And it's, you know, it's a real exercise in idiocy to behold this, isn't it? For him to hire Isabel Oakshot, who ticks all of those boxes. Like, I don't think anyone ever thought Matt Hancock was a genius. I mean, did, did you guys? I didn't. Maybe Matt Hancock thought he was, you know. That w- might explain this whole sort of get back to the top. Get back to where I was when I used to be adored and listened to. And But I don't think anyone really thought he was a genius. But I thought we thought that he had some sense rattling around in that noggin. But here is a question. If you are a Matt Hancock fan, if you're one of the fucking goggle box cretins that was voting for him on I'm a Celebrity or, or whatever, here's an awkward question for you. Ask yourself this. What age do you think you need to be at? What mental age do you need to have reached to know that that wasn't a good idea? <laughs> to hand over your personal private text messages to someone that hates what you're all about. You know what I mean? I would say a teenager would know that. I would put it at about 15. A 15-year-old would know that. Anyway, what do these texts say? Let's get on to the juicy stuff. So the first thing, the most important thing, in fact, is that Hancock appeared to... (laughs) Appeared... To ignore Chris Whitty's advice on care home tests. And you have to remember this was a big thing. Right? His whole thing was like, you know, we've got to wrap a protective ring around them. And then he goes ahead and sends all these fucking old ladies home. Right? So that's a big thing. He ignored Chris Whitty's advice or appeared to. Another big thing. This is slightly more sort of, I don't know, one rule for them. Very unfortunate, again, that this should bubble up for him and indeed for the Conservative Party. But there was a shortage of tests. I don't know if you remember that. And Hancock's team, despite this shortage of tests, arranged for a private courier to send one to Jacob Rees-Mogg's house, thereby jumping a queue of 185,000 people who were all waiting for tests. What else is there? Do you remember that shit about hitting 100,000 tests a day? Do you remember that? It was a big target. And everyone at the time, everyone that was sort of, you know, big into news and was, you know, staying abreast of the headlines and what government was planning on doing and, you know, hoping that at some point we could get back to normal if, if, if the Tories just put the corruption on hold and focused on actually governing, like, you know, all of us who were obsessed with the news, everyone was like, he's he's just committed to 100,000 tests a day, is he? Okay. And there was a lot of us that were like, mate, if you don't hit that number, like now that you've said it, that big round number, if you don't hit it, you're fucked. You are done. Because it's so clear we're going to hit 100,000 tests a day. If you miss it, you're, you're fucked. And so anyway, now it turns out 
that he only hit the number that he committed to by counting tests that were dispatched but that weren't necessarily being used. So that's fucking ridiculous, isn't it? It's like, yay, I've hit 100,000 a day, guys. Well, how did you do that? By mailing out another extra 20,000. Has anyone actually been tested with them? Nope. Like, that is not the number of tests then, is it? You dribbling little fuck puppy. That is like counting the number of women that you've slept with by the number of times you've just gone out. It's not the same thing. Anyway, obviously, this is on top of, you know, a lot of his other nonsense. You know, the VIP fast lane, the pub landlord stuff, the millionaires gaining access to PPE contracts, his in-laws. Like, the guy just fucking stinks to high heaven, doesn't he? But he's been able to coast by, I think, on the basis, as I you know said at the beginning, that he adopts a sort of empathetic tone and com style right i mean maybe some of you saw through it like maybe some of you are like uh aid what the fuck are you on about like he's a tory <laughs> like he voted through the bedroom tax and austerity and universal credit cards like you think he suddenly grew an empathy bone at 40 like <laughs> fucking late bloomer you know but no, he just, I guess he did that thing that some sociopaths do, where they come off like regular people, right? But it's just an approximation of how an empathetic person might sound or speak, isn't it? It's like, you know, he lets a little quiver in his voice happen here. He sounds momentarily affected when he says that over there. And, you know, and that's all it takes. Then this dumb fucking big hearted bell ends you know, like me, basically, people who want so badly there to be someone in the Conservative government who isn't a self-serving, crooked, corrupt sack of shit with their hand on the levers. We so want that to be the case that we're willing to cling on to this poorly acted version of it so that then we could be like, look, see, see, look, we're, we're going to be OK, lads, because one of them seems relatively all right. And then, you know, three years later, it turns out the motherfucker was just as incompetent and opportunistic as the rest of them. More fool me. <laughs> I mean, the biggest thing about the leaks for me, and I don't expect this will be the same for, for many of you, but just bear in mind, you know, how much of a news junkie I am when I say this, right? And, you know, you know what? Further contextualise it by remembering that, but for the grace of God, I was fortunate enough not to have lost anyone to COVID in that whole thing, in the care homes, in any... So, you know, this is just my perspective. I didn't lose anyone in that, you know, the care home fucking Matt Hanger. Like his his brief sort of... His brief celebration of... Uh, I guess you would call it a freedom of movement of infected old people. Fucking, you know, Hancock liberating these coughing old fuckers ushering them out of the covid wards like go now go run free riddled pensioners you're free now you know waving them off with a hanky no one close to me had it bad i don't think and certainly nobody died from it at least you know not yet we're still managing covid i should probably acknowledge at this point like it's still out there it's just not as sexy a news story these days so you know nobody gives a shit Basically, unless unless the side effect of a new variant is more dinghies in the channel, then column inches for COVID are done. Now it's over. <laughs> anyway, the biggest thing about the leaks that that came out today, right, news related, was this this text that crept out right through the fog of the PPE stuff and the hundred thousand target numbers manipulation thing, and like you know, deep in the mist, almost ignored, was this little exchange between then Health Secretary Matt Hancock and George Osborne, former Tory Chancellor that Hancock had worked with, but who at that time he had left and he was now editor of the Evening Standard. So there you go, right? So you've got Health Sec Matt Hancock talking to the editor of the Evening Standard, who he's presumably on quite good terms with. And here's the exchange, right? It goes. This is Hancock. He says, 
I need to call in a favor tomorrow. I currently have 22,000 spare slots at the drive throughs And he means testing, right? You remember back when you would drive up, get the test, do the test, pop it in a little thing, and then you would drive home and you wait for the text later, tell you if you were COVID positive or whatever. So he has 22,000 spare slots at these drive through testing facilities, right? And he continues, he says, Demand just isn't there. And this is obviously good news about the spread of the virus. But hard for my target. And he means that 100,000 a day, right? And then he says, so I really could do with a testing splash. Can we, can we make this happen? So back up a minute, right? Hancock is suggesting that people aren't going to get tested, which he thinks is a good thing because the virus has slowed down. But can I get the front page splash of the Evening Standard anyway because I've put my career on the line for the 100,000 tests a day thing? Now, Osborne, being the editor of a publication, right, knowing his responsibilities to report without fear or favour, he then asks Hancock, what on earth he's thinking pressuring the editor of a newspaper to print favorable coverage and then you know hancock reflects and apologizes and and suggests they refer themselves both of them to the independent press standards organization then they form an alliance and they actually spend the remainder of their respective careers campaigning for greater political transparency between whitehall and fleet street and they lobby for press regulation and then we fade to black and the credits roll and the pixies where is my mind starts playing no of course none of that fucking happened Happened. What did happen? Osborne says, sure, just send me the words. That's what he says. Unfucking believable. The editor of a newspaper gets a text from a government minister asking if he can just have the splash of the front page. And the editor just goes, and fuck it, this is this is word for word. This is a quote. George Osborne says. Yes, of course. All you need to do is give some exclusive words to the standard and I'll tell the team to splash it. You're almost there. Send me the words by 8 a.m. How about that shit? You know what's, you know what's funny about it is like, like this whole time... <laughs> I've been I've been trying to get press for this podcast. I've been emailing the Huffington Post. I've been troll tweeting the mail, you know, saying shit like, hey, you know, my dad used to work for the BBC and my whole family voted remain. <laughs> could you could you run a couple of hit pieces on me so I can fuck around and get verified? I've prank called the sun. I've sent press releases out about high profile guests. And this whole time, all I had to do to get a front page splash was just ask George Osborne. Oh, do I feel silly. <laughs> Man, here's, here's a fun question for you. Less Osborne related, more Hancock. Here's a, here's a question for you. Do you think Matt Hancock's new missus regrets this whole thing? <laughs> do you think, is there some buyer's remorse, do you think, to it? Do you think she realises she might have picked a bad dick here, right? Like, I always got the feeling, gather round, like, this, you know, we're all friends now. Let me just get something off my chest. I always got the feeling that amongst the ladies of this world, they sort of acknowledge, they know. Like, maybe they don't tell men about it, but privately amongst themselves, they acknowledge the anomaly of picking a bad dick. You know, like where where initially the pros of the guys, like, it seemed to stack up. He appeared to <laughs> seem like a good deal at the time. And then, you know, a little bit further down, like, in hindsight, uh, you know. Like, put yourself in Gina Collodangelo's shoes. I really hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Put yourself in Gina's shoes, right, when they started fucking around. This is the initially bit, right? When they were doing the old snog and ass grab in the office, right? I bet that was a weirdly exciting, sexy time. If you were Gina, you know, and here's this 
health secretary, this fucking cabinet minister, in a chauffeur-driven car, grace and favour flat. Everything's on expenses. You get the poshest food. Wine and cheese, secret parties. <laughs> Donors throwing money at you, not to mention the fact this guy is almost personally responsible with saving the country. You know, strap a fucking cape on him. And you're following in from, you know, meeting to meeting, media round to media round. He's passionate. He's... Empath well, he's performatively empathetic, but he's determined. He's giving out press conferences. Like, people are asking him questions, and he's responding, and they're listening. Like, what he says matters. Like, you know, you could understand how to Gina, you know, how a man with that power and status, the long hours, the late nights, how it might become a turn-on. It could serve as the proper context in which could foment sexual tension and the need for physical release, right? It could build up. It could. You could understand how that shit could just happen. And now your life is just like, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm with Matt. <laughs> Who? Like, what, the guy that ate the dog testicles? Yeah, yeah. The guy that wears roll necks to Capital FM event, the, you know, and everyone hates him. Yes. Yeah, that guy. The guy that sent every care home a fresh congregation of contaminated old cunts like the shit was knocked down ginger for the nursing desk. Like, you know, dump the St. John's ambulance in the car park, pull the cord in the nearest disabled toilet and then fucking run. That guy. I said yes! That guy. Like, like imagine making that trade. Imagine poor Gina in 2020. Making that... I'm Yeah, I'm, I'm betting... Betting it all on me and Matt, you know? Like, I thought Tories were supposed to be risk-averse, and this, <laughs> this bitch is in the matrimonial casino of politics in 2020. Like, yeah, put it all on 28 red, you know? Then the fucking dealer guy's like, no, no that, that's it, you lost it, it's game over. Sorry, you, you fucking died. And look, I know, I know it sounds like I'm mocking her, and I know it probably comes off a bit like, you know, I'm attacking him and really pulling him apart and attacking them and, you know. But there's a good reason it sounds like that, because I fucking am. I am doing that. Like, what did you think this show was? Was this your first time here? God damn it, we get dark here. And yes, we're bitter and mean-spirited. We are paid-up members of Team Petty on this show. I like the idea that people, <laughs> people might tune into this thinking it's going to be balanced and dignified discussion <laughs> i'm like oh you you sweet sweet naive innocent thing you know you're sauntering in here like um i mean you really are like a uh well i suppose you're like a lost puppy you know baby baby labrador cavorting with drunk grizzly bears or something boom another call pack to leave you on there you're basically matt hancock is what i'm saying what no no aid don't call your listeners Matt Hancocks. Don't do that. Bad aid. Then, then you wonder why he struggled to beat the Owen Jones show in the podcast charts. Does Owen Jones go around insulting his own listeners? No. He just makes them feel bad for swearing. <laughs> the fucking Mary Whitehouse of left-leaning politics. Good job, bro. Bang up job. And for anyone still listening at this point wondering if I'm throwing shade at Owen Jones or starting beef, no. No, <laughs> No, 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 no. I didn't start, you know, throwing nonsense at Owen Jones. No, I didn't. I just appeared to. Guys, that's it. That's it for this one. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I hope you are enjoying these podcasts as much as I am enjoying uh, putting them together. If you would like to join the Patreon, you get episodes of the pod two days before everyone else. So this one is going out to Patreons on Wednesday. Uh, but it's going to emerge on Spotify and Apple Podcasts on Friday uh, to everybody else, to mere mortals. So if you would like to get them super, super early bird, um, jump on patreon.com forward slash aid Thompson. 
with an I-N at the end. Forward slash Aid Thompson on Patreon.com. Um, you also get first look at live show tickets. We did one a couple of weeks ago called The Riot Society. It was me, Danny fucking Price, Jolly on Rubenstein, Denise Headley, Ashley Hayden. It was a really good time. Um, I'm going to do another one. It'll probably just be me next time. I'm going to try and shoot for some time in July. We also do in-person meetups. We did one in October, doing another one in April. So if you jump on the Patreon now, you will get first... I was going to say first look at that. The meetups, the in-person meetups are just Patreon. Um, so to get invited to that, you would have to join. Um, anyway, if you can't jump on Patreon, if you don't want to throw £3 a month in the kitty, if it's you know a rough time, hard time for us all... Um, all I would say is share me around, you know, maybe write me a review on uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify or, or whatever. Every little, you know, positive review helps. Um, or failing that, just pop out a tweet and tag me in it. Just say I'm really enjoying the show aid um, and maybe send it over to a mate of yours, like copy the link, send it to them in WhatsApp. Help me to keep growing this shit because it is growing. I'm having a good time with it, um, but I want it to get bigger and bigger. Um, and frankly, I won't be happy until I've beaten the troll. That's right, guys. The Troll. My friends Marina Perkis and Gemma Forte are doing incredible things with their podcast, The Troll. I think it's number five in the podcast charts. I'm at something like number 67, uh, which I'm actually weirdly happy about because it's, it's come a long way. Uh, but I want to be number four. I want to just... Pip. I don't want to be number one, but I just want to pip Marina and Gemma. Just, wanna, like, just be annoyingly like one ahead of them. That would be great. Um, anyway, look, that's it from me. I'll be back on Friday night with the guested show. I'll be back next Wednesday with another solo one. If you do want to join Patreon, it would mean the world to me. Um, thanks again. Until next time, I'm outie.